Hey everyone, I'm Amber and welcome to my fairy tale art channel. As I suggested last month, we're going to explore another Scottish fairy tale today, Molly Whoopie. Feel free to break out the old paintbrushes, or media of your choice, and paint along. Uh, you'll notice I'm actually doing a different medium today. I got a bit frustrated with my camera setup, and I was experimenting more with digital art recently, so I decided to do a digital piece for today's story. And I'll go into more detail about my frustrations with the piece and what was fun after I discuss the tale. So yeah, Molly Whoopie. I hadn't remembered the story very well at all. I recalled our titular heroine beating up ogres in a sack, but as you'll see, I got my wires crossed somewhere. Or the version I read years ago wasn't the version I found online. The version I'll be reading to you today comes to us from our good friend, Joseph Jacobs. <laughs> Joseph Jacobs was an Australian Jewish scholar of English folk tales, and many of the stories Anglophone kids grew up with, like Jack and the Beanstalk, were popularized by him. Molly Whoopie, however, isn't an English story, it's a Scottish one that was translated into, into English. I wish I could read you the version I can't pronounce, I'll, I'll throw the name up on the screen. Uh, it's chock full of Scots and like Scottish Gaelic and I just, I, I can't do that justice. I, I just don't have the knowledges. But speaking of Jack and the Beanstalk, this is actually a very similar story to that, only our protagonist is a girl and she's a lot more bloodthirsty, which is probably why I remember liking the story. If you haven't gathered yet, I like a good feisty heroine, and I was also a vile and bloodthirsty child, so this is the sort of story I delighted in back when I was feral and vicious. And unlike the previous two tales we've covered on this channel, the story really feels a lot more like a children's tale. So without further ado, I shall present to you Molly Whoopi. Once upon a time, there was a man and a wife had too many children, and they could not get meat for them. So they took the three youngest and left them in a wood. They traveled and traveled and could never see a house. It began to be dark, and they were hungry. At last they saw a light and made for it. It turned out to be a house. They knocked at the door, and a woman came to it, who said, What do you want? They said, Please let us in and give us something to eat. The woman said, I can't do that, as my man is a giant, and he would kill you if he comes home. They begged hard. Let us stop for a little while, said they, and we will go away before he comes. So she took them in and set them down before the fire and gave them milk and bread. But just as they had begun to eat, a great knock came to the door, and a dreadful voice said, Fee, fi, fo, fum, I smell the blood of some earthly one. Who have you there, wife? Eh, said the wife, it's three poor lassies, cold and hungry, and they will go away. You won't touch a man. He said nothing, but ate up a big supper and ordered them to stay all night. Now, he had three lassies of his own, and they were to sleep in the same bed with the three strangers. The youngest of the three strange lassies was called Molly Whoopie, and she was very clever. She noticed that before they went to bed, the giant put straw ropes around her neck and her sisters, around his own lassies' necks. Uh, he put gold chains. So Molly took care and did not fall asleep, but waited till she was sure everyone was sleeping sound. Then she slipped out of bed and took the straw ropes off her own and her sister's necks and took the gold chains off the giant's lassies. She then put the straw ropes on the giant's lassies and the gold on herself and her sisters and lay down. And in the middle of the night, up rose the giant armed with a great club and felt for the necks with the straw. It was dark. He took his own lassies out of the bed onto the floor and battered them until they were dead and then lay down again, thinking he had managed finely. Molly thought it time that she and her sisters were off and away, so she awakened them and told them to be quiet, and they slipped out of the house. They all got out safe, and they ran and ran and never stopped until morning when they saw a grand house before them. It turned out to be a king's house, so Molly went in and told her story to the king. He said, Well, Molly, you are a clever girl, and you have managed well, but if you would manage better and go back and steal the giant sword that hangs on the back of his bed, I would give your eldest sister my eldest son to marry. Molly said she would try. So she went back and managed to slip into the giant's house and crept in below the bed. The giant came home and ate up a great supper and went to bed. Molly waited until he was snoring, and she crept out and reached over the giant and got down the sword. But just as she got it out over the bed, it gave a rattle, and up jumped the giant, and Molly ran out the door, and the sword with her, and she ran, and he ran, till they came to the bridge of one hair, and she got over, but he couldn't. And he says, Woe well, worth you, Molly, whoopee, never you come again. And she says, Twice yet, Carl, quoth she, I'll come to Spain. 
So Molly took the sword to the king, and her sister was married to his son. Well, the king, he says, You've managed well, Molly, but if you would manage better and steal the purse that lies below the giant's pillow, I would marry your second sister to my second son. And Molly said she would try. So she set out for the giant's house, and slipped in, and hid again below the bed, and waited till the giant had eaten his supper and was snoring sound asleep. She slipped out, and slipped her hand below the pillow and got out the purse. But just as she was going out, the giant wakened and ran after her. And she ran, and he ran, till they came to the bridge of one hair, and she got over, but he couldn't. And he said, Woe well, worth you, Molly Whoopie, never you come again. Once yet, Carl, quoth she, I'll come to Spain. So Molly took the purse to the king, and her second sister was married to the king's second son. After that, the king says to Molly, Molly, you are a clever girl, but if you would do better yet, and steal the giant's ring that he wears on his finger, I will give you my youngest son for yourself. Molly said she would try. So back she goes to the giant's house and hides herself below the bed. The giant wasn't long ere he came home, and, after he had eaten a great big supper, he went to his bed and shortly was snoring loud. Molly crept out and reached over the bed and got hold of the giant's hand, and she pulled and she pulled until she got off the ring. But just as she got it off, the giant got up and gripped her by the hand, and he says, Now I have caught you, Molly Whoopie, and if I had done as much ill to you as you have done to me, what would you do to me? Molly says, I would put you into a sack, and I'd put the cat inside with you, and I'd the dog aside you, and a needle and thread and shears, and I'd hang you up upon the wall, and I'd go into the wood, and choose the thickest stick I could get, and I'd come home, and take you down, and bang you till you were dead. Well, Molly, says the giant, I'll just do that to you. So he gets a sack, and puts Molly into it, and the cat and the dog beside her, and the needle and thread and shears, and hangs her up upon the wall, and goes to the wood to choose a stick. Molly, she sings out, Oh, if you saw what I see. Oh, says the giant's wife, what do you see, Molly? But Molly never said a word, but, Oh, if you see what I see. The giant's wife begged that Molly should take her up into the sack till she would see what Molly saw. So Molly took the shears and cut a hole in the sack and took out the needle and thread with her and jumped down and helped the giant's wife up into the sack and sewed up the hole. The giant's wife saw nothing, and began to ask to get down again, but Molly never minded, but hid herself in the back of the door. Home came the giant, and a great big tree in his hand, and he took down the sack and began to batter it. His wife cried, It's me, man! But the dog barked, and the cat mewed, and he did not know his wife's voice. But Molly came out from the back of the door, and the giant saw her, and he ran after her. And he ran, and she ran, till they came to the bridge of one hair. And she got over, but he couldn't. And he said, Well worth you, Molly Whoopie, never you come again. Never more, Carl, quoth she, will I come again to Spain. So Molly took the ring to the king, and she was married to his youngest son, and she never saw the giant again. And there you have it. Short and sweet. Murder and theft. Destruction of an entire family. Honestly, I feel like the giant's wife didn't really deserve to die. I mean, she did feed Molly and her sisters and try to keep them safe. Ineffectually, but she tried. Uh, so there's actually quite a lot of what we might term as female jacks across the wide swath of global fo folklore. You know, Jack in English tales is usually like a giant killer. He's usually a dude. Molly and her giant slaying kinswomen are pretty common too, though. Uh, writer Sarah Allison in her blog, Writing in Margins, has a cool list of them in her blog post, Molly Whoopi and Other Girls Who Fight Ogres. I'll link the article below. It's super interesting. I'm gonna have to track down some of these because they sound really rad. Like the story she mentions of Fatma the Beautiful from Sudan, who fed an ogress to crocodiles and who wears the skin of an old man. Like, what is up with that? I need to, I need this story in my life. But yeah, so I like women who kick ass, but in general, I don't super get excited about like giants in fiction. I, I don't know why, just giant stories aren't, aren't usually my favorite kind of story. They're okay. Maybe I'm giant neutral. I like a good trickster story. I suppose I'd find the story more emotionally satisfying if I felt we had a real good reason to hate the giant. Uh, I suppose trying to kill three orphan girls because, uh, reasons is kind of shitty. But like, maybe giants are really territorial because nearby kings keep trying to steal their stuff, you know? He's not wrong to mistrust the girls because Molly sure as heck is ready to murder everyone and steal all his life's belongings. Granted, she probably would not have if he'd been kind to her. And this is a Scottish story, and if there's one thing I know about Scotland, it's that good manners towards guests is pretty much like a sacred duty. It, like in many cultures, hospitality follows certain rules that must be upheld. 
and the giant violated that by trying to kill the girls who were guests of his household. So if you place the story in that culture, rather than, say, my urban Canadian culture where hospitality is much less a matter of life and death than, like, you know, historically, uh, the story makes a lot more sense. The giant's wife did not prevent her husband from trying to murder three guests. She barely tried. The whole family is tarnished and must be killed. Harsh, but that's folklore for you. Removed from its culture and context, the things that are fantastical and the things that ring true just sort of meld together and become kind of bizarre to the modern reader. Although, frankly, I think that's part of the charm. So what do you think of Molly and the Giant? Please let me know in the comments. I love hearing all the takes and reactions to these lesser known fairy tales that I've never really been able to share with anybody before. Oh, and if you're having a good time, please like and subscribe so that you'll know when I upload a video. But onto the painting. So this was equal parts good fun and just mental screaming. So much screaming. Digital art is actually super out of my comfort zone, even though it's technically the first kind of art I really did apart from, you know, pencil and paper. So history time, baby preteen Amber was really into like digital dolls, you know, like with the Z back in the early 2000s. And I used like Paint Shop Pro 7 to paint clothes on like the doll bases. That was a time. <laughs> Do any of you remember those drag and drop prep bases? Like those websites where you could like drag and drop paper dolls? Nostalgia, anyone? Okay. So like the Lord of the Rings is coming out and I was really into following and idolizing doll creators and who would like recreate in pixels, like in pixels, sometimes without use of the smudge tool, these like gorgeous elf dresses. But like eventually I got past that, you know, um, got into Photoshop and then I was using Paint Tool Sci a bunch in like 2015. But I've been using watercolors for years now, and I haven't really returned to digital seriously. So this is kind of the first time in ages, and I feel kind of clumsy and like I got two left thumbs, and it's just like a time. And I was also trying something different. So I tried a limited Zorn-inspired palette. So the painter Andrew Zorn allegedly painted with just four colors, yellow ochre, ivory black, vermilion, and titanium white. So I wanted to try it, but because it can sometimes be hard to pick colors in digital because there's so many colors you could potentially pick. You have like the whole range. Um, I thought that'd be really cool to create a really warm tone painting. Um, I think it might have been an experiment that would work better with traditional paint or if I'd used more of a transparent glazing technique. So I found myself kind of fighting trying to understand the palette in a digital form while I was also trying to make the painting work. So yeah, that was, that was kind of frustrating. Although all in all, it was interesting. Like I really like the color combination. Would totally try that again. Oh, and you know how last month I said I spent all that time thumbnailing and sketching and that was super useful and prep work is great. Someone inadvertently, I got carried away with this piece. I was never satisfied with the composition or the perspective or the shapes or those clouds, which were so fun to paint, but eventually I had to scrap them because I didn't feel they were working. I just kept pushing with it and I learned a lot, but like, I think it would have been a stronger painting overall if I'd spent all that time actually focusing on like the initial thumbnail stage and making sure that like my shapes were really strong, my values were really strong. Eh. But you know, that's the whole part of the learning process. There's, it can only get better from here, right? <laughs> and I do like the sky and I'm happy with Molly's level of sass and I drew feet. Feet used to be really hard for me and now they're just challenging instead of impossible. So all in all, I think that's all I've got to say about Molly and this painting. I hope you're all doing well out there. Take care and make good choices. 